Hello and welcome back to this morning's Diverse Ed event for Early Careers Teachers. We are on panel two and I've got an array of guests for us. I'm just going to spend a few minutes introducing them before I hand over to them uh, for their provocations. And with us we have, in no particular order, we have Becky West, who is a special education teacher uh, from Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 4. Welcome, Becky. We have Dominique Leong, who uh, is a deputy head teacher and is the Southwest Regional Lady leader of BAMED. Welcome, Domini. Uh, we have um, Halil Tamgamosh, who is uh, a head teacher. And we have Julie Cassiano, who is a, a, also a head teacher. And finally, we have Paulina Tervo, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of Lufta, one of our uh, co, uh, one of our partner organisations at Diverse Ed. I'm going to start with you, Becky, uh, for your provocation. So you've got you've got five minutes on the floor. Uh, talk to us, please. Good morning. Thank you, Benny. Um, I have to admit, I'm a bit nervous, so uh, I'm going to be. Uh, as organised as I can about this. So I thought I'd start uh, this way. Uh, my favourite talk that I've ever watched is um, Brienne Brown and she uh, her talk of the power of vulnerability. So I'm going to start there. She talks about the fact that she's a storyteller and for all of those brand new teachers out there, being a storyteller is probably one of the best ways that you can engage your children. Um, and storytelling is all about connection and belongingness. And uh, when she did her research, she talks about shame. And I think um, my section today is about intersectionality and it's to do with uh, sexual orientation and autism. And I think both of those um, diverse areas can sometimes hold quite a lot of shame for lots of people. Shame because um, of obviously all of the things that come along with uh, disability and, um, well, all diverse diversity but I think it's the bravery that we have as teachers that I think is one of the most important things um so I myself I am les a lesbian but I am also um ADHD um and this is something really important so it's quite a new thing that I've been diagnosed with ADHD um which is obviously something else that's a problem as new educators because girls are often not diagnosed and obviously can go through their whole education um not knowing quite what's wrong and um, this then can cause other mental health issues, so something to watch in your classrooms. Um, but I think that sharing that and having that vulnerability is one of the biggest things as educators you can make sure you do, and it's something that I hid for quite a long time as a teacher, and I think in the past 18 months, and lots of this was fueled by watching a talk by Benny, actually, uh, coming out to my class and... Um, talking to them about not just my sexuality, but also my ADHD has made a huge difference for the impact that I have on the children in my classroom. So as Benny said, I'm a special education teacher and um, my class are all boys <laughs> because they're all autistic. And again, it's a problem with diagnosis that girls often aren't diagnosed because uh, they present differently. But um, my class of boys definitely work harder because I'm open about who I am because that we feel like we belong in the classroom. And the reason why that's important in terms of intersectionality is there's been a lot of research in the past five years that is starting to show a correlation between um, autism and gender or sexuality diversity. There is a higher prevalence if you're autistic that you will be gender or sexuality diverse. And the concern about this is lots of that research at the moment is about just bringing that correlation together and actually, it's great that we have recognised that, but there's nothing to help how we can support that. And I think that's a huge thing in your classroom, that as you sit there, you will have children in your class who are autistic, you will have children in your class who are ADHD, and you will have children in your class who are gender and sexuality diverse. And if you are not catering for those children and you're not thinking about those things, um, you're doing a disservice to those children that potentially could lead on to mental health, um, more mental health, because you're not talking about these things. So um, it was 2018 the government did their paper, and I know you've got uh, Sean Delenti on later, and you've got Andrew Moffat, who are huge inspirations for me as well. And uh, they both talk about this paper, and it obviously has fueled the new SRE curriculum that we're all making sure we're implementing now, I'm sure, uh, because it's fueled the LGBT action plan. And in there, it said that teachers uh, 
initial teacher education felt like they could talk about these things. But when they got into schools, they still felt held back. Um, I want you to be brave <laughs> because it's so important. As the child who went through Section 28 in my schooling, it was so important that the teachers couldn't talk to me about it. And then to not have been noticed for being diagnosed, that's a huge part of my life that wasn't noticed. So as new educators, you need to notice these things. And also, if you are those things, tell them. It's a huge connection. It makes you real to the kids. And if you're real to your children, they're more likely to do what you ask, I promise. Um, so it's still a complex issue, though, particularly when you talk about autism and sexuality. So I think LGBT and all intersectionality is still complex. There's so many issues between race. Um, as someone who has been out in uh, the gay scene in London for 20 years, I do know there's still a lot of issues around the intersectionality. But with disability, you've got a new set of issues because there's often a nervousness because parents don't want you to talk to their children about sexuality. And I think it's really important that you're brave and you have those conversations with your kids because I've got to stop, but uh, talk to your children. If they want to know things, share with them. That's the most important thing you can do. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Becky. That's really powerful. Um, you know, just in the, the factualness and the, the lived experience as well is really, really powerful for us all to hear. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to move over to Dominique now. Dominique, uh, you have your five minutes. Please do share with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about decolonizing the curriculum. And to summarize why we need to do this, I wanted to start with a quote from the Black Curriculum Report that came out this year. Um, the report said that attempts to modernize the history national curriculum have provoked widespread controversy, which has challenged the idea of what British history should entail. Widening the scope of black history in the curriculum can support our whole society towards unlearning negative tropes and relearning more accurate discourses situated around race and racism. So basically what we teach our young people in society is currently a victim of identity politics arising out of a fear of diluting a historic concept of Britishness and fueled even more by recent nationalist and populist rhetoric when our moral imperative should be to teach the truth in as accurate a way as possible. And, and that's what I'm trying to get across today. So thinking about how can we go about actually decolonizing the curriculum, because it's quite an overwhelming thing to, to consider. I believe it needs a deep process of curriculum overhaul for all subjects. So it shouldn't just be a bolt on like one or two lessons stuffed into the history or English curriculum. I believe that time must be committed and it should be a marathon, not a sprint. And this deep process of curriculum overhaul should be alongside everyday anti-racist teaching practice or quick wins. So how I've captured it, um, it for my school, the work that I'm doing at my school, is by talking about it within four key areas that we need to increase representation. We need to challenge the colonial narrative. We need to remove barriers and we need to harness student voice. Um, for example, the easiest win um, is to ensure diverse representation in uh, images that are used in our curriculum and in historical and recent achievements um, and recognizing that BAME is not a homogenous group or to model a range of accents speaking in standard English. Um, or to, we could remove barriers by ensuring that English idioms are explained and not assumed. And this is something I still struggle with as uh, someone who is from an EAL background, um, even as an adult. Uh, the, more, the more challenging but deep-rooted pedagogical shift is to systematically identify colonial influences on Western nations and to discuss them openly with students. For example, how um, colonial influences have uh, created um, food, the culture of food um, here in Britain, the spread of language around the world in music, etc. And another really challenging thing is to openly discuss issues of hate crime, xenophobia, racism, and racial bias at any relevant opportunity and link them into current events. 
but also um, one of the four key areas I mentioned is harnessing a deep process of student voice and involving parents too. For example, in Bristol, we've got parents with a deep knowledge of local African Caribbean history. So how are we involving them um, in, our, in our curriculum design? We also have some parents um, originally from other countries where they were scientists or mathematics professors and haven't been able to uh, secure the same role here. But how can we work with them and use their expertise and knowledge in our curriculum? Um, I want to now just talk about what else ideally needs to be done to prepare the foundations for this curriculum work. I really believe that the groundwork needs to be laid through developing a school cult culture that's committed to changing the curriculum. And this means having hard conversations with staff about unconscious bias, racism and white privilege and tackling the overrepresentation of, of uh, BAME students in sanctions and discipline. Ideally, undertaking multiple aspects of this work at once and considering both the regional and local challenges and contexts that are relevant to the school. And part of this groundwork needs to be the personal work that's done by school leaders, whether that's reading, whether that's listening to the stories of BAME staff, students and parents, or even a race identity in school leadership coaching program that, that we're doing at my school where our white head teacher, she models the way and she leads the work with me. She's open and transparent with staff about the ups and downs of the personal and emotive journey she's on to lead the school through this fundamentally important change of culture. The Running Me Trust said last year, the reality is and will continue to be that the overwhelming majority of staff in UK schools are white. As such, it is imperative that they are part of the solution. And I really believe it cannot be the BAME staff leading the way all the time. Teachers of all subjects need to feel confident in having the racial literacy to lead this work. But the level of historical and sociological knowledge needed for this won't be easy or quick to achieve. So it means making significant time for well thought out CPD with expert input. For example, we should use our local universities, many of the whom are already leading on this research. In summary then, decolonizing is not just about addressing what was wrong in historical accounts, i.e. challenging the narrative. It's also about celebrating what is right, changing the narrative and challenging how knowledge is created. Uh, we should be developing students' exploration and critical thinking on issues of social justice, their own rights and those of others and giving them the vocabulary to do so. We need to remember that our children are, are already discussing these issues. They're obtaining their information from sometimes really dubious internet sources. So we have a heavy moral responsibility to teach and discuss these issues with them and not run away from it out of fear. Thank, Thank you. you. That was really, really insightful. So much to think about. Um, and I'm sure that our guests will agree. Um, and, and actually moving over to Halil now, you know, Halil, you're going to be talking about uh, the curriculum as well. So please do take the floor. Absolutely. Um, OK, so um, I'm a head teacher uh, in, a, in a primary school in Leicester. And what I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit, a little bit, bit more nuanced. Um, I'm going to talk to you about culture. Um, and it's an ethnicity. It's a really hard thing to kind of like um, uh, define. Uh, ethnicity uh, takes in a lot of things, culture, traditions, uh, religion. It, it, it takes in, it's a, basically a, a group of people. Um, and I want to talk to you about that today because it, it, it's meaningful to me. Um, as a Turkish Cypriot, um, growing up in in this country and going to going to school here and being educated here, um, the feeling of being othered, and also uh, the feeling of having a dual identity, um, it, it still sits with me. It's still prevalent with me today. So when I mean a dual identity, I mean being something at home uh, and keeping that very very separate. So very Turkish Cypriot at home, and then being um, non Turkish Cypriot at school. Uh, because I had to fit in, um, and I, I was fearful about um, not not being accepted. So I, I'm just going to talk to you about some quick wins. All right, as a, as a head teacher, we talk about the curriculum, and and I Dominic talks loads about you know the overhaul of the curriculum and and, and that marathon, and it is a marathon. It, it takes time, 
but there are some quick wins. So I, I think it's really important that these things that we do and what I talk about today are not bolt-ons. So they're, they're not shoehorned in. They're not name drops of culture. It's actually part of our culture as, as a school. Uh, and we continually think about um, how we are expressing ourselves and allowing others to express themselves. So now I'll just go through a few things. So the first thing is to know your class. So for those of you that are coming into the profession, new to the profession, know your class. You know, know what the makeup of your class is. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really important. I know it sounds, it sounds really like um, minor, uh, almost like, uh, you know, like a pointless activity. Well, they're my class, right? You know their names. But actually what I mean is do you know who they really are? Take time to learn a little bit about their backgrounds, you know, and it's so powerful. You know, we're building up relationships with children just to know a little thing about where they're from, what they eat, um, you know, certain words in their language. Um, it, it's so powerful, but it, it also is really powerful in the sense for the child. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, Benny's, I'm really lucky to have had, um, you know, connections with Benny before this and making mistakes is all right. And I think we're really fearful of that as, as, as a profession. We're scared about what, what the right thing to say is, what the wrong thing to say is. But it's okay to make mistakes as long as we learn from them and we're not ignorant to, it, to, to our mistakes. Um, and then give those children a chance to shine. Man, you know, how nice is that? You know, I, I mean, seriously, with all, uh, I, again, I, I know uh, Paulina's here as well, and Lifter, we're going to talk about Lifter, I know Lifter's going to come up in a minute. Um, we've got Lifter at our school. And so, you know, we've, we've got this, we've had this opportunity with the right resources to be able to um, galvanize amazing conversations with our children. And I think lockdown really, really like kind of brought it to the fore. So, uh, one of the, the the amazing stories from from the Lifter platform was shared with uh, with a Year Four class, and uh, there was a, a picture, 360 degree kind of like picture, immersive picture of a bakery, and the bakery was in Afghanistan. Tell me if I'm wrong. I might be wrong. I'm trying to remember it, but I think it was in Afghanistan. And what it did was, it opened up conversations with children from other backgrounds because they recognized the bread that was coming out of the oven. And that sounds really small and like tiny, but these are kids that would never talk in class. All of a sudden, they've got something that they can connect to. And food is just brilliant, by the way. Food is always the best way to connect with people. Um, but it was just such a, it was magic. You know, I was listening to children that wouldn't normally speak. And they were, they felt that they had a connection. So, I mean, for me, really small wins, really, you know, things that will allow those children that don't normally get a chance to shine and feel like they belong and feel like they are part of something for them to, to come to the fore. But it also exposes those children that are not from those groups to be exposed to different. And if we're talking about acceptance and belonging, if we do not allow this uh, exposure to happen, then we're never going to get to that point. So just really quickly, and I know I keep talking, I talk a lot, I know I do, I'm really sorry, really quickly. So I spoke to you at the beginning about me being a Turkish Cypriot, growing up. I, I completely separated my two worlds, and I did it purposefully, and that went all the way through my secondary school. Only I only had one friend that used to come around my house, and he was a and, and he was Maltese. Um, you know, he was he wasn't English. He wasn't white British, and I did it because I was really fearful about what the comeback would be. I was really fearful of the fact that yeah, we had carpets hung upon our wall, and yeah, we we ate stuffed vine leaves. Now it's all in the it's all in the main now, when you understand what that is now. But back then, talking about stuffed vine leaves, I would be seen as backward. So I would never, ever have exposed myself and allowed myself to have been exposed in that manner. So I think it's just really important that we just give children the chance to bring their whole self to the classroom and for you to allow them to do that. But really quick wins, really quick wins. Thank you, Halil. We, we, I allowed you a few more minutes there. That, is, that was definitely cheating. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, really 
be powerful um, about helping children understand and be proud of their identity. Um, it's what really came across. Thank you. OK, we're going to go over to Julie. Julie, will you share with us your thoughts, please? I thought I was not going to unmute. Can we all hear me? OK, good morning. I'm Julie Cassiano. I'm a head teacher in Northamptonshire. Um, I've only been doing it a term, so I'm still learning. Um, so I want to talk about mental health in schools. Um, I'm on a panel that um, is directed towards children, but for me, as a head teacher, from the minute I go in, I'm responsible for the mental health and well-being of every single individual, as far as I'm concerned, in the community, uh, stakeholders, staff, and children. And it's an area that I'm extremely passionate about. I have lived experience. Um, um, I don't know how much we know about ACEs. They're not spoken about a lot, but they're adverse childhood experiences. Um, I'd uh, clocked up five of those by the time I was 18. Uh, the trajectory of children who, um, if you get one, they're quite serious. You can get up to one to 10. Um, and I did a self-study of myself because I realized it wasn't until a head teacher I worked with two years ago and did start to talk about myself. He said, do you realize what your achievements are and how phenomenal they are? And you can go on to change many lives. And I said, I don't really know um, how, how that came about. Um, so I did a self-study on myself and I went back and I've read, please, please uh, go and uh, watch the TED Talk by uh, Nadine Burke Harris. And she wrote a book called The Deepest Well. And it really explores um, the dark trajectories that children can go through if they clock up um, ACEs. But I'm here to tell you, you can change all that as an educator. Um, and you will have staff who've had ACEs and you will have children in your class who are clocking them up left, right and centre. And you really need to know what they are. Psychologists do say you should not use them. Don't assume it's a really dangerous word to assume that children are going to be on these trajectories. They are going to be on these pathways. But it's really important to have a really good understanding about what they are. So I urge you, if, if you <laughs> look at the TED Talk, then go to, I think it's a really good DFE document, the mental health and behaviour in schools. And if you take yourself to page 14 and 15, and I've shared this with a lot of staff, um, it goes through the risk factors um, of what children go through um, in terms of what could lead them onto quite serious mental health illness. And I say illness because we're throwing a lot of vocabulary around. Mental health illness is a diagnosed condition mental health and well-being is very very different um and if you if you go there it comes under and it's something that i use to aid my uh diversity work and um, if you go down the risk factors it's in there discrimination okay and that's where we go to intersexuality okay so um <clears throat> being exclusive or not in, not having an inclusive curriculum and everything that we're talking about today goes on to harm children it causes trauma and it is serious. And we're responsible for that. And I think as educators, we, we, we are very fine tuned to explore what the dangers are externally for our children. What are those? I always talk about meteors coming in and I've got to protect the world from these meteors. But what are the meteors that we're creating internally for our children? Um, and that's by not you know, adhering um, to the Equality Act um, and thinking about those protected characteristics and what we're doing internally. So, yes, we're looking at the external factors that can go on to harm our children's mental health. But what is it that we're doing internally? How is it? And I, I, everything that's been said today sits with me. Do you know your children? Do you know where they're coming from? And not knowing them is, is really harmful um, because not bringing now allowing them to bring themselves could go on to potentially really harm children. Um, and, that, and, and, and really do look at those risk factors and what they are because it's got a really nice section where it says the protective factors and it shows what you can do to alleviate, to stop those threat, you know, be coming out of control. Um, I would also ask um, that you look at the Young Mind Survey if you're in secondary education, because they've just done um, a really good survey published in January about the impact on children's mental health from COVID. Um, and <clears throat> I look at this, Children and adults are no different. So when I'm scanning all of this, I'm thinking, well, my adults are having these same experiences. So as a head teacher, the staff are my responsibility, they're my class, and then they go on to be the leaders of the classroom. Um, so generally, uh, the experiences are that bereavement is, well, that's quite an obvious one, but actually um, from tensions within the household, physical abuse has increased. Um, child line has experienced 22% 
um, an increase, a rise in um, phone calls about physical abuse um, and that they're not recognising that it is abuse. Um, and also with lockdown, they're not allowed to get away from the abuse, whereas before school was giving them uh, that respite away from those experiences. <laughs> uh, domestic, domestic abuse, um, and I've worked in Leicester as well, Halil, um, and now I've moved to Northamptonshire. And I know in Leicester, I used to speak quite a lot to, um, I used to do safeguarding and it was Operation Encompass. And then she used to speak to me a lot about the rise. Um, she's one late, she's phenomenal. But yeah, and we've got the same in Northamptonshire. So it's, it's about us knowing that, but not assuming it. Knowing that what could potentially be harming our children, but not assuming that it is happening. It's about getting those relationships with the children to to talk to us. Um, so that's so the domestic violence yeah. and the physical abuse. Julie, I'm going to pause you there um, because it is, it is time to wrap up. And I, and I wish I could listen to you all day. Um, but I'm conscious that we've got another guest. and um, We do need to move on. But we will pick up some of this when we come to the chat as well, because I think, you know, the comments are showing some really great feedback and, and some really lovely, uh, insightful thoughts as well. So apologies for pausing you. I'm going to move over to, to Paulina, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of Lifter, um, one of our partner organizations. Paulina, over to you. Thank you, Benny. Um, so I've decided to talk about why stories matter. I'm going to start with a story that happened to me about 10 years ago when I was working as a filmmaker. I'm holding a heavy camera in my arms, which are shaking from the sheer weight. It's 35 degrees hot, humid, and I'm standing in the middle of the biggest slum in Dhaka, Bangladesh, filming a UK A-list celebrity who's crying and talking to the camera. We've just visited several homes in the slum where we've met young mothers who are still children themselves, who live in abject poverty and whose children are malnourished. My brief for the day has been to make the A-list celebrity cry in front of the camera, because that's what will make people donate to the charity that I'm doing the gig for. I start crying myself because of the absolutely devastating stories of hopelessness that we're telling. And because I've been told by the local staff that the families we're filming are not the beneficiaries of their aid and therefore will not be helped. What this narrative was doing was problematic for many reasons. It reinforces the white savior narrative, portrays the poor as a helpless, one-dimensional group who are only gonna be saved by our charity. It also only shows one side of the story. What we didn't tell was how the young mother might have been part of a women's entrepreneur group saving together to launch a business, or how she's a resilient and resourceful person. We didn't humanize her, we victimized her. I felt disgusted and embarrassed for being there. It was the first time I had ever taken an assignment like this, and it was absolutely going to be my last. It was clear to me that what we were doing would not bring about sustainable change. I realized that I wanted to tell stories that are empowering, and even if they had tragedy or difficulties in them, they would also be hope and humanizing. So I wanna fast forward five years, I'm filming another mother. This time it's in Helsinki, Finland, uh, which is where I'm from. As she tells me her life story, at times it is so emotionally gripping that after the shoot, I break into tears and actually I'm not somebody who cries. I don't even cry in movies. Um, Habiba was a child when she came to Finland in the early nineties as a refugee from Somalia. To give you some background, in 2018, over 50% of Somalis in Finland were unemployed. And when it comes to women, that figure is even higher. Many Somali women become nurses or care personnel. And when Habiba was 15 years old, she was told by a school counselor that she would be best off becoming a nurse, as that's what most other Somali women do. And that's when she decided it wasn't gonna be her route because her interest was in citizen activism and politics. Like many other Somalis, she got married young and she had many children, but she always knew that she wanted to do more than just be a mum. In her mid-twenties, after seven consecutive years of childbearing, she divorced her husband and moved back to Finland with her children. There she became a city councillor and she started working for her community to help young people who faced institutional racism that put them at risk of marginalisation. It hasn't been easy for Habiba to do what she's doing, and she constantly battles with hate speech and racial abuse just because of what she looks like. So the story we ended up telling about Habiba 
It's emotionally powerful, yet it's hopeful and it's empowering. She's an incredibly resilient and positive person. She makes us see that despite adversities, there are always options and there are ways to change your life. Habiba's story has been seen by thousands of children and teachers in the UK and Finland. And for many people, she's an incredible role model. And for others, meeting her has given them a window into someone's life that they might otherwise never have met. So they would have heard a story that showed them a new perspective. Habiba's story is one of many stories that are featured in Lyfta's learning environments that we call Story Worlds. At Lyfta, our mission is to share beautiful human stories from around the world to better understand ourselves, each other, and our future as individuals, as communities, and as an entire planet. I think that storytellers and media outlets have a big responsibility as to how we tell stories, because stories shape our world, and they shape perspectives and attitudes. So it really matters how they are told. The world is nuanced, it's complex, and it's beautiful, and there are a million ways of telling someone's story. At Lyfta, we choose to tell stories that humanize people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paulina. And, and if you are new to Lifter, please do go and have a look at the website um, and get in contact with the team because it's such a powerful resource. Um, and I know that everyone I know who has trialed it, who has used it in their schools, um, it's transformed uh, children's view of the world. Um, I'm going to hand over to Hannah now, who's got the difficult task of curating the questions. Uh, so over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Um, fantastic inputs from all five of you. So thank you so much. And not many questions in the chat yet, but I've been scribbling away. So I can see a couple of questions coming in. I want to come to you first, Paulina, because I think you, what you summed up at the end there about the media's responsibility, about how we tell stories, really makes me think about how irresponsible the media has been in the last 12 months about some of the stories that have been told. And like, do you want to just um, add your thoughts about like, how do we as educators actually develop that critical thinking in our young people about not just accepting the narrative they are consuming when it comes to the media? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really challenging task um, for teachers at this time because there's simply so much what we call fake news. It's really hard to know, you know, what is the right thing to bring to the classroom, I guess. And also it's about, you know, what we consume. I mean, we just have to be very careful what we take as the truth. and. And I think the, the fact that we have multiple perspectives, you know, it really helps because if you just see one perspective, you're, you're not going to have a very fully formed view of the world. So I think the media can be very dangerous and we have to learn to kind of critically um, consider that. Yeah. Thank you, Paulina. And, and Dominic, I think it'd be remiss of us not to mention the civil report today. And I know that Baymed's been very loud about it. Do you mean just do you want to share any thoughts about the kind of that publication of that report and and how we should be in, in, engaging with it? Yeah, I think, you know, things that we've um, been talking about in Baymed is just that we're not going to let that report um prevent us from carrying out the work that needs doing um and i think the, the the report is you know we have to acknowledge that it's been written i think that um for you know for for many of us it, it's it's just too simplified it's too simplistic it's um it's trying to uh, present a narrative uh that's you know of a particular uh style and I think that it's just um, just something that we, we we have to live with, but we have to not let it deter us from the work that we know that needs to be done. And um, and that's really, I mean, on a personal level, I've been very angry. I felt that it has um, taken away my own lived experiences, you know, and and growing up, you know, uh, having and even as an adult. Um, uh, being um, someone who's experienced the, the things that they're saying don't happen, uh, um, or the things they're implying don't happen, uh, I think it's it's just it's very disempowering for a lot of um, BAME people. Um, yeah. So, but it's not going to stop. The, the 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 children are the next generation, and I th I honestly think that um, looking at how 
active our young people are today um, and in around social justice issues, that they're not going to take that. You know, they won't take a report like that. It doesn't sit with them at all. And, and so I think that's that's hope, really. Thank you, Dominique. And, and you've woven there some of the things that Pauline has said. And the danger of the single narrative, We to empower people, we need that multiplicity of the perspective and the storytelling. And hello, if I can come back to you about your dual, ident dual identity and dual narratives. I mean, you were very reflective and very honest about you almost like compartmentalised yourself in, in your childhood. Like, what are your tips to people listening who have who are dual heritage, who are mixed race, who are biracial? Would you have done? Would you do things differently if you could go back in time? Um, I, I think so. I think, I, yeah, I think I would have done. I would have done things differently um, if if I was if I was given the space to do so, Hannah. Uh, and and you know, we talk about psychological safety so much. You know, we you know so being psychologically safe, being being mentally safe uh, to be able to express yourself. Um, if I had that at school, then yeah, I, I'm really proud of being Turkish Cypriot. So proud, uh, and and the culture and and everything that comes with it. It is such a, it's a contradictory um, uh, um, place to be. So Cyprus is a very interesting place, um, but it's beautiful. The people are wonderful, um, and its history is just incredible. I, I'm extremely proud of it, but. I feel I feel like uh, weirdly I feel that like other people have missed out on knowing about it because I wasn't I wasn't able to share that and yeah I, Hannah I don't I, I don't hide it I, I failed all my GCSEs I felt really disengaged from you know from from a young age I felt disengaged from school and education and uh, and and I had to I had to dig deep to find find the next layer of 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 what I wanted to be next and and so yeah I'm I'm a head teacher now so I've, I managed to get through it so yeah I'd do things differently. Hello thank you and just to follow up there's a question just come in about like were your family aware of that separate identity was it your was it your um sort of like survival technique or were they aware of it? Um yeah really interesting question actually um some I, I remember I mean sadly my dad's passed away now but I remember my dad um asking me um you know why, why don't you bring people around? You know, we're you know Cypriot Cypriot people are very social animals. You know, we you speak to anyone Greek Cypriot Turkish Cypriot. We we want people around all the time. We want to feed people. We want to we want to be part of something all the time. Um, so my dad did ask me why why don't you bring people around? And and I just said, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I haven't got I haven't got many friends. Um, and and that was my survival technique because I didn't want to bring them round. It was almost bad. I feel bad talking about it because it feels like I was ashamed of my background and I'm completely not ashamed of my background. But I suppose the fear of being ridiculed um, and and being bullied, it was it was too strong. So my dad my dad would question it. He was a he was an, you know really intelligent man. You know, he'd be able to to see past why people weren't coming. But um, it was difficult. It, it was difficult. So they knew um, but they never pushed it. Thank you, Halil. You you always give such open, um, vulnerable answers. So thank I really appreciate that answer. Thank you. And and coming back to you, Becky, Halil mentioned their psychological safety. And that references back to what you talked about about sort of like your own identity, how you've navigated your own diagnosis. Um, and just mm -hmm. think, like thinking about the early career teachers who are listening, what are your tips for how they can create that safe classroom space for not only themselves but also for their young people to, to share to share parts of their identity that perhaps are suppressed? Um, so I think it's really difficult because I think those natural conversations happen all the time. And I think that's where, I think it was Dominique saying that we need to make sure that our curriculum is based around the people we teach. And we need to make sure we have those visual representations because actually one of the biggest things I've noticed, I've got um, five, uh, seven white British boys in my class. All of them don't think they're going to get married and have children. And I think that when was the last time you had a visual representation during your sex education or your relationships education that had someone who had a disability, that had someone who was openly autistic or ADHD? And I think that's where I thought it was important to make sure they knew both those things about me, because that is making that statement about your sexuality suggests that it's something you're open to as well. 
And it did, it brought huge conversations. We had conversations about asexuality. We had conversations about um, what the concept of queerness was and the fact that um, when you discuss it with children, they're more likely to come out with the answers themselves. And I think there's huge things, because you were saying to Paulina about um, the media, one of the biggest things is just taking that 10 minutes sometimes when you've seen something in the news. So um, at Christmas, the Sainsbury's advert um, that caused so much controversy on Twitter, um, I showed them the advert and then asked the children to tell me what was different in that advert between their Christmas and the Christmas they saw. And they could tell me that the roast potatoes weren't as good because my mum makes the best roast potatoes. And they could tell me that we'd never have that many people around our house because I couldn't cope with the noise. And that was acknowledging their sensory needs. Um, they never once mentioned the colour of the people around the table. And I think that's really important because I didn't have to do anything. I didn't even have to critically think. I then showed them the tweets and they were disgusted. So I think sometimes just taking those 10 minutes that you do naturally have to have a normal conversation like you'd have with your friends. In a great professional. Oh, great. No, Betty, great advice. Great advice. I'm thinking about the Cadbury cream egg, egg um, advert as well, the, the, the kind of the same sex relationship. So it, it doesn't take a lot of time. It's about creating the space for these conversations. I think that's a brilliant piece of advice there, Becky. Thank you. And Judy, can I come back to you about dream? What, you talked a lot about the assumptions we make about people and you mentioned some of the risk factors, but you, you, I think you got cut off when you're talking about some of the protective factors. Do you want to just elaborate what you mean by that, please? So what, what, so I don't know if I also mentioned I have a mental health diagnosis, hence why as I speak on that. So I was diagnosed with um, OCD, PTSD, and I've been linked with Becky. We've been talking because I think from, um, I think I've got a misdiagnosis for ADHD as well. Um, so the things that I've been doing in school is, I think, sorry that I'm so theory based, but that's the way I am. But Bandura, and I'll put all this up on Twitter, has done excellent work on self-efficacy. Um, and that everything I do from the SDP down to everything I do for staff and children um, works around. Um, it's a, it's to sum it up, it's quite complex. But it's to develop a culture where people are capable of taking control of themselves. And I think when we try to support people, there is a tendency to be sympathetic and to want to nurture people and to wrap people up in cotton wool. And that's actually it's it, it doesn't work that way it's about you know we don't want to diagnose people we want people to take control what are your barriers what can I do for you can you help me understand um, and, it, and it's framing it in that way and giving people ownership of whatever their barrier is also self-determination theory is something that's running through um, and this is about giving people autonomy competent competence and um, relatedness which is what Diverse Ed is all about. It's about belonging and purpose. People need to be connected and they need to feel that they belong to something to buy into it. And it raises self-esteem. Um, and research has shown that not just, I don't just look at, you know, successful leadership in education. I look at the business world and the business model and how they do inclusion and how they, and, and this is a model that's running through and it is proven to raise the mental health and well-being of staff. But I also uh, talk to teachers about how they incorporate this into the planning. So how, how are pupils, how have they got autonomy? How are they being able to feel competent? And how do they belong and what's their purpose? So that's, that's, that's a yeah, model Julie, no, Brilliant, Julie. Thank you so much for breaking that down. And, and Pauline, let me come back to you because I know all the work you're doing with Lyft of res resilience is one of the values you spotlight through the resources and through the stories. Do you want to just signpost to the listeners uh, why that value is so important in the stories you share? Wow. Um, yeah, like you said, I mean, all of the Lyft stories are really about resilience. Um, I think it's something that some people don't recognize that they have within them. And it's quite hard to sort of say, like show what is resilience. So that's why we think that through these human stories and through adversities sometimes or tragedies, but, but a way of getting out of those that can show resilience in a really meaningful and kind of tangible way. Um, and I think it's there that kind of connection happens in students' minds. That, oh, that's resilience. Actually, I have it as well. So sometimes you just need that visual cue. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Paulina. And Dominic, digressing here, there was a, there was a question earlier on I missed, um, specifically about how do we decolonise the STEM subjects? Have you got any advice yeah. about that suite of subjects? Yeah, um, I think they're um, actually really powerful ways to decolonise the STEM subject. I think um, really it goes down back to looking at the foundations of um, science and maths, because a lot of it actually doesn't originate in the West, yeah? It's recognizing where our um, foundations of science and math, but also looking at um, technology from uh, um, around the world and some of the brilliant architects that um, have existed. I found out only last year that um, somebody, the, the person who designed or first created skyscrapers is actually a Bangladeshi and I'm Bangladeshi, I'm half Bangladeshi and I didn't know that until I was 40 years old and I was quite upset by the fact that I didn't know that. Why did I not know that? You know, he created something that is a worldwide uh, concept structure and I didn't know that. Um, so there are lots of things. Could I just add one thing um, to what you, everyone's been saying is, um, firstly, I think people have been asking about a lot of um, resources and so on. And the, the BayMed website has a lot of resources for teachers um, to help with decolonization. And there's um, CPD on their videos and so on. But there's a really good resource that's not on the BayMed website that I came across recently that's related to what we've been talking about. And it's a TED talk by the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And it's a, it's about the, the power, um, or, no, sorry, the danger of the single story. That's what it's actually called. Um, and it's such a good um, TED talk, just it thematically links to what we've been talking about. Brilliant, Dominic. Thank you. Great signposting there. And I can't think what he's called, but there's a, a black architect on Twitter who for 54 days tweeted out architecture from each of the 54 countries in Africa. Going back to Paulina's point about disrupting the dominant narratives that we, we always show pictures of poor people from African countries, but actually there's a wealth of architecture and history there that we need to be showcasing as well. So my final question is for you, Benny. There was a question earlier on about signposting for um, CPD. I know you could do 45 minutes on this, but like perhaps three things Things. For the early career teachers, what's three things they should be looking at around CPD? I certainly think that, you know, starting with a, a good reading list um, is the way forward. And, and we've talked about this in the last se session. Uh, the Diverse Ed website, the Bay Med website, uh, LGBT Ed, Disability Ed all have resources around what you should be reading. And uh, I think it's important to remember that it's not incumbent upon the person with the protected characteristic to do the heavy lifting. Um, and so we come to the table with our knowledge, armed with knowledge, and we go out and find that in the world before we ask the questions, before we kind of uh, present our opinions so I think the best CPD is for us as teachers to be readers um, and and that's the, that's the starting point and and from there you know so much of what I've learned has been from these grassroots movements that have sprung from Twitter starting from women ed all the way up to um, disability Ed. Um, and, you know, our foundation of Diverse Ed was a kind of result of that, the, the conversations that happened. It's a brilliant space for learning, Twitter. I know it's also a brilliant space for arguing and falling out, but, you know, there is something at the core of it that means that we can learn from each other. So I would encourage you to go out and, you know, connect with those grassroots movements with their Twitter handles um, and, and to join the conversations um, because they are rich, they're fertile. Um, and that's honestly been the, the space that's given me the most CPD in this area. Do you want to close, Benny? I am going to close. I didn't know if I'd muted myself or not. Right. So I would like to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers on panel two today. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to you. The comments are uh, through the roof and there's lots of feedback on Twitter as well. Please do join us again at some point. We are now going to take a break to welcome our panel three guests. So we will close now and see you again at 11 o'clock. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Diverse Ed ECT event today.